Welcome back. Welcome back to PSYOP Radio. This is Smiles Lewis, and uh, we're in just getting started on our homage, remembrance, uh, tribute to the late paranormal ufologist John Alva Keel. John Alva Keel. And uh, my co-host, Mac White, is... Uh, uh, sitting this one out tonight, he's uh, getting over not feeling well, but we wish him well. And uh, we invite you all to give us a call tonight at 512-879-3805 to uh, talk about the memory of John Keel and what he mean, means to the, the UFO fields, uh, paranormal fields, and uh, you personally, perhaps. Uh, in fact, I think we do have a caller who's been waiting patiently. Um, let's go to area code 207. Hello, caller. Can you hear me? Hi, this is uh, Lawrence Coleman Smiles. Mr. Coleman, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. Well, um, I'm glad to be here with you. Happy birthday. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, I was uh, um, positively surprised uh, to hear from you uh, when you informed me that it's again your birthday, uh, as it is every year. And uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, my goodness. Um, now, see, with uh, Keel, he talked about how uh, there was all kinds of weird, weird phone stuff. Uh, so, how can we tell? I recognize your voice, but uh, he reported that uh, in his uh, Mothman chronicling, he was experiencing a whole range of strange uh, phone problems. So, how can I really be sure it's you? Except that I'm looking at the number and going, "Yeah, I think that's our our Lauren there." Um, you don't have caller ID. My goodness. <laughs> Well, it didn't pull up your name, but uh, um, right. it's good to hear from you. Uh, thank you for joining me this evening. And uh, boy, goodness, um, you were well, in... quite a shocking week, you know. To uh, you know, Friday, July third, Keel dies, and then I I write my obituary when I hear the news on Monday, and then I get contacted by his family who had not heard that he died yet. <sighs> And because of the obituary, I told them where the hospital was and that things, and they found his body in the morgue unclaimed. So it just got from more bizarre to, you know, weird. And, and that's kind of typical of what I would have expected for John Keel's passing. So it was, you know, it's just been quite a week with a lot of people talking to me about this and me talking to the family. So I'm I'm glad to be here talking about John. Well, um, he meant a lot to me. I was just relating how that particular uh, Garuda cover that I uh, reproduced uh, from your cryptomundo.com site, the um, the site you write for, um, that that was the first uh, inkling I ever had of of uh, Mr. Keel uh, was the Mothman prophecies. And that was, I guess, a lot of people's introduction uh, with the movie, but that book for me really started concretizing what I was finding in other lesser um, uh, known uh, areas of the ufological spectrum of research uh, was this acknowledgement of, of uh, other areas of import beyond simply um, a cryptozoological interpretation of, of strange creatures that seem alien and, and unknown to humans, but uh, also this this connection to the folklore surrounding the these balls of light phenomena. And Keel often talked about uh, these balls of light resolving into either a, a creature or a um, an, a structured craft, and that seemed to be at the heart of a lot of what he seemed to be saying about the nature of this weird phenomenon. How did, well did that really did that inform your idea of of these phenomena at the time, or uh, and and if so, has it changed? Well, I, I think we have to back up. For me, I, I knew Keel from the middle of the '60s, and. The Mothman Prophecies book came out in 1975, but long before that, uh, John and I had been corresponding and, you know, talking on the phone once in a while. But I helped him quite a bit with his book, Strange Creatures from Time and Space, which came out in 1970. And if if you recall, uh, well, I think it was Operation Trojan Horse in 1970 and about the same time with Strange Creatures. And in Strange Creatures, he had a whole 
appendix about the sightings of Mothman, and he'd actually written his article about uh, the Mothman in Flying Saucer Review. And his views of of Mothman really evolved. He was a, a good friend of Ivan Sanderson, as I was. Ivan, being a biologist, really talked to Keel about the biology and the sort of the nuts and bolts. And so Keel, from 1966 to 1967, changed from someone who was a 40 and looking for tangible evidence to someone, as he told me later in life, who who would never call himself a ufologist, but he called himself a demonologist. Mm. And so all of his way of looking at the world really became much more sinister, much more psychological, and much more demonological. So, no, I wasn't informed by Keel's new journey, but what I did like about Keel was he was a thinker, he was an intellectual. You know, for somebody that dropped out of high school and ran away to Greenwich Village, he was a very intelligent man, and I, I like that about him, although you know we can talk maybe later about how he became cranky <laughs> later on. But, uh, you know, so he, by the time that he wrote Mossman Prophecies, he was fully in the midst of what I, I really think was his blender mood. You know, you'd throw in a psychic, you'd throw in a UFO case, you'd throw in a mechanical robot case, and some reports of Mossman, and you sort of mix it all together, then you have MITs and, uh, you know, men in black cases, and cases of strange orientals showing up and cattle mutilation. For Keel, it all became all one thing. And I think for people that are are new to John Keel and read the Mothman Prophecies, which was, in many ways was his, um, as I said to some friends of mine the other day, John Keel's the Mothman Prophecies is Fortiana's in cold blood. Ah, wow, yeah. <laughs> because he very much took a case that was going on and took some things that personally were happen- happening to him in New York, in many ways paralleling Truman Capote's sort of approach to it all, to you know the crime that he talked about in cold blood. And Keel, sometimes you can't tell when he's fictionalizing something when he's giving dialogue that he sort of remembered uh, versus some that he made up. And it all kind of goes together in a beautiful book. And, and even the opening of the book, you know, with the, the storm crackling across the horizon, has many, you know, a feel about it that is, is more like a novel than it is a, a nonfiction book. Indeed, and I think that's what led to it being a, a successful adaptation to the film, to the silver screen. Um, was that they were able to, uh, while changing some of the facts and details, uh, really capture the the mood and the ambiance uh, that his writing for that particular book uh, has. Um, I, I I'm holding a copy of of uh, the paperback of Jadu. I couldn't find my hardback. I went over to the arc the anomaly archives today, grabbing up all the uh, Keel books I could find so that I could uh, refresh my memory and look back and I got to reread some of the, so many of these, uh, but I, I've still never read Jadu, uh, the greatest book ever written on the black magic of the Orient. Um, uh, one of and the, it, has, it has his case uh, where he's uh, following a Yeti, you know, and he sees, he sees two abominable snowmen in the jungle. So it's, <laughs> it, Keel thought it was his autobiography and, Considering how young he was, he was, he had a quite a big ego about writing his autobiography so early. But that was Keel for you. Well, he apparently did. Uh, um, he has a very colorful life. Um, I was just uh, going over some notes, and um, apparently he used to write uh, um, one-liners or comebacks for the Merv Griffin or something, and. Um, or at least oh, yeah. I think he's uh, he's on tape saying such a thing, uh, and um, this this thing where he was part of a, a broadcast from inside the pyramids um, uh, at a, at a time when that kind of thing was just uh, really uh, technologically uh, uh, challenging. Um, but um, I, I I agree that he, as you were saying. 